Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd. Continuing with our program which discusses the four qawaid or the arba qawaid from Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala which is a very important treatise about the concept of Islamic monotheism and the way the scholars have deduced on that Islamic monotheism entails not just believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, but in fact actualizing by practice, by worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and actualizing by worshiping Him subhanahu wa ta'ala based upon his divine names and attributes by calling and supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala said in his treatise, he began by saying, No, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you to obeying him. That Hanifiya is the religion of Ibrahim. It is worshipping Allah alone and making the religion purely for him. Likewise, Allah commanded all of mankind and created them to worship him. him. And Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنُ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind in jinn except for the purpose of worshiping me. Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned regarding this, he said, this is the worship which is considered real worship. And the person who performs it will receive reward and an abundance of goodness. As for the person who mixes by worshipping Allah and other than him, then that is not considered worshipping Allah. Like in the hadith narrated on the Prophet wasallam, who narrated on his Lord Subhana, Allah the Almighty said, I am the most self-sufficient, free from shirk, and whoever does a deed and associates a partner with me, or other than me, then I have left him, and his shirk. Shaykh Ibrahim al-Rahili hafadhullah ta'ala states, Obedience to Allah is of two types. Being obedient to His commands and obedience by avoiding what Allah has prohibited. Allah created the slaves to worship Him and He promised them forgiveness and paradise like what was mentioned in the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Mu'adh, atadri ma haqq Allah al-ibadi, wa ma haqq al-ibadi ala Allah. So Mu'adh, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asked Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, O oh Mu'adh, do you know the right of Allah over his servant, and the servant's right over Allah? Mu'adh said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah wa rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and His Messenger know best. The Prophet ﷺ responded by saying, The right of Allah over His slaves is that they worship Him and do not ascribe partners to Him. And the right of His slaves over Him is that they will not be punished if they do not ascribe partners to Him. Then I said, meaning Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Ya Rasulullah, afala ubashir al-nas, O oh, Messenger of Allah, should I tell the people? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not tell them because they will depend on that, meaning that they will refrain from doing good deeds. Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi rahimahullah ta'ala stated about this. He said, In this verse, mentioning the above verse that we mentioned, is evidence that the purpose behind creating men and jinn is that Allah tests them 
with his commands and prohibitions and other things which turn them away from obedience to Allah the Almighty. So whoever is affected by those things which turn him away from Allah and abandon worship, then he is one of the losers. So whoever takes from this worldly life and uses it to fulfill his purpose, then he is the one or he is one of those who are successful. Meaning that the person who uses this dunya, uses this worldly life to come closer to Allah as a means to bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they have achieved success. The most successful and most honorable of creation are those who are blessed with guidance and blessed to be servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A servant is honored in accordance with his or her servitude to Allah. Those who are more obedient to Allah have greater honor and faith. And those who are less obedient are less deserving of honor and have a lower level of faith. If a servant is dutiful in worship, his path and provisions are made easy. And he will be blessed in all of his affairs and be protected in every way by Allah. Like in the hadith of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, where he said, the Prophet sallallahu said, guard Allah's commands and he will protect you. The scholars mentioned that this statement is full of meaning. And that whoever guards his religion and worship, Allah will protect him in all of his affairs. So for, for you and I, what we gain from this is that we have to protect our worship. When it's time for prayer, we have to go and establish the prayer. When it's time to, when we have the opportunity to pay charity, to give charity, and when it becomes an obligation to pay the zakat, then we pay the zakat. When it's time to smile, just even offering something simple as a smile or a handshake, then we should be the first to do that and give salams because these are acts of worship if the intention is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we are blessed with wealth, that we spend it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We spend it in obedience to Allah to come closer to Allah. Hanifiyya, O oh Hanifiyya, is explained as moving from shirk to tawheed, from misguidance to guidance. And it is the religion which is complete monotheism, which Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was blessed with. And in fact, all the prophets alayhim afdal salatu was salam were called, uh, uh, were, their message was based on tawheed and monotheism. They called their people to Tawheed, to the worship Allah alone and not associate partners to Him and to stay away from those things which are worshipped besides Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رُسُولٍ إِنْ نِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا تَعْقُودٍ That we have sent to every nation a messenger to worship Allah alone and stay away from those things which are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Shaykh went on to say, So if you know that Allah created you to worship Him, then you know that worship is not considered worship except with Tawheed, except with monotheism. Likewise, prayer is not considered prayer without purification. So that shows us what? That a shart of worship or a condition of worship is monotheism. Just in the same way that one of the shurut of salat or one of the conditions for the salat or prayer is tahara or purification. A person's prayer is not accepted unless they have wudu as the Prophet said that the, that the salat لا يقبل الله صلاة أحدكم إذا أحدث حتى يتوضأوا that Allah does not accept the prayer of any one of you that has uh, made the ritual impurity except after purify himself. So showing that purity is a condition for prayer. Likewise, in order to worship or in order to worship Allah, to have true worship, the, the real meaning of worship, worship in Islam, the haq, uh, worship haqiqiyya, 
then this is, can only be with monotheism, Islamic monotheism, Tawheed, Tawheed of Allah. That means recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship, that he's the creator of the heavens and earth, worshiping him and him alone, Tawheed al-Ibadah, and also affirming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine names and attributes as he affirmed them for himself. And as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam affirmed those uh, divine names and attributes in authentic hadith text. And the Shaykh went on to say, therefore, if shirk enters into worship, it nullifies it. Similar to how an impurity invalidates purification. Meaning that if a person commits shirk, if it is the minor shirk, then it will invalidate that action of worship that the person was performing. And if it was the major shirk, then this can take you out of the fold of Islam. So we have to be careful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily Allah does not accept associating a partner with him, but he forgives other than that for whomsoever he pleases. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushrika bihi wa yaghfiru ma duni thalika liman yasha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, O children of Israel, worship Allah my Lord and your Lord. Verily whoever associates partners with Allah, then Allah has prohibited him from paradise and his abode is hell and there is no supporter for the oppressive sinners. Shirk or associating partners with Allah is the most grievous sin and whoever dies on the major shirk will abide in hellfire forever. And those who commit the minor shirk will have the deed in which they committed, uh, committed shirk in invalidated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have revealed unto you though, and those before you that if you commit shirk, your deeds would be nullified and you would be one of the losers. So the person who commits shirk is a loser. The person who commits shirk will have their deeds invalidated. So it's upon you and I to avoid this at all costs, Muslim. An important principle which is derived from the Shaykh's description of the relationship between Tawheed and shirk and purity and impurity is that the reality of something is not in its name but in its real substance. This is a, a, a fiqh principle. Al, meaning that when a, a thing or a something is not what it is called or what it is named by people, but in fact it is in accordance with its real substance. Therefore, for example, if a person claims to follow monotheism and worship Allah alone, this is their claim, but yet they commit shirk, then this cannot be considered valid worship as it contradicts monotheism and it contradicts the principle of the ulama, the scholars, that they have, they've showed us that, uh, that, that something is not in its true substance, is not what it's called, but it is what it is in reality. And also, for example, those individuals that other the testimony of faith, they say the shahada, they say la ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And they go to the Prophet Sallallahu grave, for example, and supplicate to him. They ask him to uh, bestow blessings upon them, and they ask them to take, they ask the Prophet Sallallahu to take them to paradise. They ask the Prophet Sallallahu to uh, give them guidance or give them wealth or provisions then this cannot be considered as fulfilling the worship we were created for due to their mixing shirk with worship because they mix, mixed uh, polytheism with monotheism. Shirk contradicts and negates Tawheed and worship is only authentic Islamically based upon Tawheed. So we cannot associate any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Shaykh began his treaties, began uh, his introduction, or he continued on in his introduction, in fact, before he began the first uh, principle. He said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Therefore, if you grasp 
that shirk, when it mixes with worship, it nullifies it and negates the deed it took place in. And the one who commits major shirk will be of those who dwell in the hellfire forever. Then you will realize that the most important thing for you is to comprehend this in hopes that Allah will free you from this web or these various types and means of shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily Allah does not accept associating a partner with him, but he forgives other than that for whomsoever he pleases. By knowing four principles Allah the Almighty has mentioned in his book, it will protect you from shirk. So this is how the, sh the shaykh, rahimahullah ta'ala, began his text, began the treaties. He introduced to us and let us know that shirk nullifies tawheed and that we have to actualize true tawheed and that is a condition for Islamic monotheism. Those are the lessons that we gain from his introduction. So then the Shaykh began with his first principle. He said the first principle, it is to know that the disbelievers that the Prophet ﷺ fought affirm that Allah the Almighty is the creator and disposer of all affairs and that was not sufficient to enter them into the fold of Islam. The evidence for this is the statement of Allah the Almighty, say who provides for you from the sky and the earth? Who possesses the hearing and sight? And who brings the living from dead? And the dead from the living? And who disposes all affairs? They will say, Allah. Then say, why do you not then fear him? This is what Allah said, subhanAllah. Look at this verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how Allah in fact vanquished the ideologies, the foreign ideologies in fact, of polytheism that entered into the fold of Islam and that were part of the pre-Islamic customs. The, this, these arguments Allah revealed to the Prophet in the Quran in order to deal with the doubts of the mushrikeen the pagan Arabs of the time. And we still deal with the same ideology now. Only now the people say, La ilaha illallah wa, an, wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. But yet they go to the graves and seek refuge in, from the people in the graves. Or they seek to come closer to Allah or seek intercession with the, the people who, the inhabitants of the graves. So, Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi rahimahullah ta'ala said about the above ayat that we mentioned, this principle illustrates that acknowledging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's worship, Tawheed al rububiyyah His Lordship, does not enter a person into Islam. Therefore, whoever affir affirms Tawheed al rububiyyah affirms that Allah is the creator, provider, disposer of affairs, that He gives life and death, health and sickness, and wealth and poverty, happiness and sadness. Whoever acknowledges all of that still does not enter Islam. This is because the pagans, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fought, used to believe that Allah was the creator, provider, disposer of all affairs, and it did not benefit them at all. This is due to the fact that they used to worship others along with Allah and disbelieve in the message of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and deny the day of judgment disbelieve in the Quran and deny it and claim the prophet sallallahu rabbi wasallamu alayhi was a sorcerer and a witch this is what they claim this is what the pagan arabs believed so the shahid or the per, the point here that sheikh ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala was making is that although the, the pagan Arabs, they actualized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was one and that he was the creator, the, the disposer of affairs, the, the provider, the sole creator and so forth. But that wasn't sufficient for them to enter the fold of Islam. They still were committed, they still committed shirk because they violated Tawheed al-Ibadah. They violated the Tawheed of worship, meaning uh, Tawheed al-uluhiyah which is the tawheed of worship that you have to actualize that it's not sufficient to say it on your tongue it's not sufficient to just believe it in your heart you have to actualize this because if you ask even Jews and Christians 
If you ask some of the Hindus, if you ask possibly the Sikhs and others, they will say God is one. And they'll say he's the creator, he's the sustainer, he's the provider. But do we call them Muslims? Of course not. Because they violate Tawheed al-Ibadah. They do not worship Allah alone. They say Allah has a son or a daughter. They say Allah is three, the trinity. They say Allah is uh, so-and-so as the Hindus say, or so-and-so as the Sikhs say. So they violate Tawheed al-Ibadah, and of course they also violate Tawheed al-Rububiyah in some ways. The point being that this will not enter you into the fold of Islam. It's not sufficient for us just to believe that Allah is one and He's a sustainer and creator. That we have to actualize that through worshiping Him and Him alone. Shaykh Saleh al-Suhaymi, Allah Ta'ala, explains that although the pagans believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship, they rejected worshiping Him alone. They used, to, they used to sacrifice their animals to their idols and swear by them, similar to what some of the people who associate with Islam do today. They sacrifice to the deceased in the graves and swear by them and vow in their name. They seek support and aid from the people in the graves and they supplicate to them and ask for assistance and ask for favors from them and relief from difficulties. And then the Sheikh went on to say, he said, I swear by Allah, I heard with my own ears a person who supplicated to the deceased in a grave and he humbled himself before the grave like I do in front of my Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who believe and do not mix their iman with dhulm. And dhulm in general means oppression. The Prophet ﷺ explained to us what dhulm means in this verse though. The Prophet ﷺ said that dhulm in this verse means shirk. So polytheistic practices negate one's tawheed and lower one's faith if it is the minor shirk and nullify it completely if it is the major shirk. The companions of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ asked, O Messenger of Allah ﷺ, who amongst us does not oppress himself? The Prophet ﷺ responded by saying, It is not as you say. To not mix faith with oppression, vum, means with shirk. Do you not listen to the statement or did you not hear the statement of Luqman ﷺ where he said, Verily, shirk is a great vum. The greatest oppression is oppressing oneself by committing polytheism and usurping the right of Allah to be worshipped alone. And the hadith of Itban, where he said, verily Allah prohibits, the Prophet ﷺ said, verily Allah prohibits the fire from the one who says the testimony of faith. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, seeking the pleasure of Allah. Therefore, sincerity and acting upon the testimony of faith are conditions for its acceptance by Allah. We have to act upon Tawheed. Tawheed is not sufficient to have just on our tongues. The second principle, the Shaykh said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said the second principle. He said, the pagans say, we do not supplicate and turn towards them except to come closer to Allah and for intercession. The evidence that they sought to come closer to Allah is the statement of Allah the Almighty and those who take besides Him supporters say, we worship them only that they may bring us nearer to Allah. Verily Allah will judge between them wherein they differ. Verily Allah does not guide a lying disbeliever. That's the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the speech of Allah. That is the Quran. That Allah was dealing with all of these doubtful issues that people who worship graves and seek intercession from statues and idols and the dead and from the elephants and from pyramids and from uh, necklaces and all the other things that people seek refuge in and people turn to and people supplicate to and people have hope and love and fear that reaches the, the state of worship that all of these things are false. And Allah dealt with that in the Qur'an. 
And Allah says, verily Allah will judge between them wherein they differ. Verily Allah does not guide a lying disbeliever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let us know that disbelief, that this is disbelief. That he doesn't guide those people who do these things, meaning seeking intercession from other than him subhanahu wa ta'ala, by seeking and supplicating to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by worshiping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this will not benefit you at all. This is shirk, and Allah described it as disbelief. The evidence that they sought intercession from other than Allah is the most high subhana, his saying. They worship other besides Allah, others besides Allah who cannot benefit them nor harm them and say they are our intercessors with Allah. SubhanAllah, that's another verse from the Quran. They worship others besides Allah who cannot benefit them nor harm them and say they are our intercessors with Allah. Ask yourself in your country, wherever you may be, how many people who say La ilaha illallah in your community وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ They bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. And that Muhammad is the last prophet and messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They, they say the testimony of faith. But then they go and they seek refuge in Tijani. Or they go and seek refuge in Abdul Qadir Jailani. Or they go and seek refuge from many others. How many people do this? And don't, don't they read the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they worship others besides Allah who cannot benefit them nor harm them and say they are our intercessors with Allah. It requires no explanation there. The verse is complete and very strong and prohibiting seeking intercession, intercession from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shaykh went on to say intercession is of two types. The prohibited intercession and the affirmed intercession, meaning affirmed by the Sharia. The prohibited intercession is that which is sought from other than Allah for that which only Allah is able to fulfill. And the proof is Allah the Most High statement, O you who believe, spend of that which we have provided for you before a day comes when there will be no bargaining nor friendship, nor intercession. And the disbelievers, they are wicked sinners. The affirmed intercession is that which is sought from Allah. And the intercessor is honored with intercession. And the one who is interceded for is someone whose statements and actions Allah is pleased with. And after his permission, subhana. Like the Most High said, who is he that can intercede with him except with his permission? So the, the interceder need the one interceded on behalf of and the interceder, they need the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they and Allah must be pleased with them, or they will not receive intercession from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An integral part of understanding this principle is that those who worshipped others uh, uh, other deities besides Allah, Allah did not uh, Allah did not accept their worship because they believed and they created, they believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was uh, the Lord and sustainer and that he created and that he provided sustenance. And they didn't believe that those things that they worshipped provided sustenance and were the creators or that they gave life and death or brought forth the rain from the sky, or caused plant life to grow. All of those things they did not believe they had control over. However, their argument and evidence was that they, the deities and idols, would intercede on their behalf with Allah. According to the statement of Allah, they said, we worship them only that they may bring us near to Allah. That's a verse from the Quran. We worship them only that they may bring us nearer to Allah. That's their argument. That's what they believe. So they didn't believe that those idols and statues that used to be in the Kaaba, in Mecca, or wherever they were, they didn't believe that those things would bring the rain for them. But rather, they worshipped them because they believed that those things were cleaner and purer and would bring them closer to Allah. Isn't this the same argument that some of the extremists amongst our community hold? That they say, hey, we only uh, worship 
or we only supplicate, and they don't even believe supplication is a type of worship. They say we only supplicate to Abdul Qadir Jailani or whoever because they will bring, bring us closer to Allah. We only go to the grave of Najashi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu, because he will bring us closer to Allah. We only go to the graves of the Sahaba and supplicate to them because they will bring us closer to Allah, Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhum, Ajma'een, or to their Imams or whoever. Regardless of whether they're righteous or not righteous, they go to them because they believe they will get into, they will, those inhabitants of the grave will intercede on their behalf because they believe that they are not pure enough to supplicate to Allah. But they have to realize Allah described that as worship. And the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ described seeking intercession and making supplication as worship. The Prophet ﷺ said in Sunan Tirmidhi, he said, a dua huwa ibadah. That supplication is ibadah, it is worship. So anytime you supplicate to anyone or anything that is considered ibadah, and if it is to Allah, it is real ibadah. It is accepted ibadah. And if it is to other than Allah, it is false, it is shirk. Very simple principle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they say they are our intercessors with Allah. This is what their argument was. And considering the pagan Arabs' argument for committing shirk with Allah, we can draw a parallel with what the people used to say during the time of Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Rahimahullah ta'ala. The people uttered the testimony of faith. There is no God worthy of worship except Allah. And Muhammad is the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, they felt the need to seek intercession between themselves and Allah. Although the people claimed Islam as their religion, many of them would supplicate to inhabitants of the graves to seek intercession or perform pilgrimage or seek blessings from trees and rocks. And this was similar to the practices of pre-Islamic times. Even today, for example, in places like Ethiopia, people travel to King Najashi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, or Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu, his grave, and supplicate to him, and seek his intercession. Some Muslims mistakenly seek intercession from the Prophet Sallallahu in this life, by supplicating to him. Salawatu Rabbi wa salamu alayhi. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who are the most deserving people of your intercession on the day of judgment? He sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever says that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, sincerely from his heart. So that shows us we have to be sincere in the testimony of faith, sincere in our practice. And also another benefit from this hadith is intercession will take place in the hereafter, not in this life. So we do not supplicate or pray to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the angels, saints, or anyone or anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaykh Ahmed al Ghaniman states, this intercession is for those who are sincere. And specifically for those who fulfill tawheed after the permission of Allah and not those who commit shirk with Allah. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, everyone who has complete sincerity and actualizing through knowledge, belief, and deeds, loving, hating, and having enmity based upon there is no God worthy of worship except Allah is the most deserving of mercy. A part of intercession is asking someone to negotiate a judgment and to overlook one's sins and lessening a person's punishment and increasing the reward for the one who deserves it. Intercession is of two types. The general for the prophets and angels, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, salawatu rabbi wa salamu alayhi, and the believers, and then there is also the specific type of intercession, which is for the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The specific type, which is for the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to intercede for the Muslim community on the day of judgment when the sun will be near and people will be immersed in their own sweat according to the level of their sins. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ will also intercede for the people of paradise to enter it. The third type of specific intercession is he ﷺ will intercede for his uncle Abu Talib to have a reduced punishment in the hellfire. And Abu Talib was a disbeliever. He died a disbeliever. He died on shirk. He died on kufr. He didn't believe in the message. He wouldn't uh, 
he wouldn't utter the testimony of faith, unlike the Shia and others who claim that he was uh, a believer. The general type of intercession, this is the second type, it encompasses all the prophets alayhim afdal salatu wasalam and the angels and righteous believers, which includes interceding on behalf of those deserving to enter the hellfire to be excused from it. Secondly, they will be allowed intercession for those believers who are punished in hell to be taken out of it. Thirdly, they will be allowed intercession for the people of Al-Araf whose evil and good deeds are equivalent. And so they will be halted between paradise and hell until they are interceded for before. Then they will be, uh, be able to proceed if they are interceded on behalf of bi'idhnillah ta'ala. Fourthly, they will also intercede for those in paradise to be raised to another level in paradise. Seeking intercession should only be sought from Allah. And He can only fulfill our request, subhanah. The pagan Arabs used to worship idols that needed to be transported, that required cleaning, that could not provide any benefit or harm, nor could they speak. And this is similar to all the various things, objects and beings that are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and used to intercede on their behalf. To find people who utter the testimony of faith, seeking intercession from the, de from the deceased is appalling for many reasons. And even by mere logic, we have to ask, how does one seek intercession from someone who cannot help themselves or prevent their own death or come back to life or who could not prevent their own sickness? This is the state that some communities that attest to the testimony of faith are in. They are practicing shirk, shirk just like the pagan Arabs with beings and created things which cannot intercede for even themselves by raising their hands to supplicate to them, crying, showing extreme humility, and hoping for their mercy and their intercession. And we ask Allah the Almighty to bless us to be of those who are, exceed, who are interceded on behalf of and the day of judgment. And may Allah tabarak wa ta'ala bless us all with Jannah Tafradus. And until our next sitting, wa sallallahu wa sallam, ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. يا خاطب الحور الحسان وطالبا لوصاله بجنة الحيوان أسرع وحث السير جاهدك إنما مسراك هذا ساعة لزمان